Good evening, and welcome to the complete works of William Shakespeare, A Bridge. Now we have just a few announcements before we get underway. The use of flash photography by any means, audio or video, is strictly prohibited. If you have a cell phone, please take a moment now to turn it off. And if you have a pager, well, you need to get yourself a cell phone. <laughs> For your convenience, toilets are located in the bathroom. Also, please take notes of the exits that are nearest to your seat. Should the theater experience a sudden loss of pressure, oxygen masks will drop automatically. Simply place the mask over your mouth and nose and continue to breathe normally. If you're at the theater with a small child, place your mask on first and just let the little water fend for himself. <laughs> and remember, ladies and gentlemen, in tonight's performance, you control three things. Your words, your thoughts, and your actions. <laughs> Allow us to introduce ourselves. My name is Matthew Camarno. And I'm Morgan Sorrells. And it gives me great pleasure to announce that we are about to attempt a feat that we believe to be unprecedented in the history of civilization. That is to capture a single theatrical experience, the genius, the magic, the towering grandeur of the complete works of William Shakespeare! Now we have about an hour and a half, and this book weighs about six pounds. So that means we have to get through eight ounces every seven seconds. That's like binge watching American Horror Story all in one weekend. So we better start watching. No one knows more about Shakespeare and asylums, covens, murder houses, freak shows than the woman that I'm about to introduce. One of the world's most preeminent Shakespearean scholars. She has a certificate of completion from www.preeminentshakespeareanscholar.com. And she's here tonight to provide the complete works of William Shakespeare abridged with a much needed preface. Please welcome me and join me, Miss Olivia Powell. Morgan, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, William Shakespeare, playwright, poet, struck for his proud of flower, tripling from the heart of the English countryside to one bask in the warmth of London's literary greenhouse. A man who, despite the ravages of male pattern baldness, planted his potent seed of his poetical genius into the fertile womb of Elizabeth's England. There, it took root and spread to the lymphatic system of our Western civilization. And yet, how much do we intellectually flaccid members of the 21st century society appreciate the plump, productive fruits of William Shakespeare? How much? I'm glad that you asked. Bob, can we have some conflict? Great. Now, you are a theater-going crowd obviously of above literary sensibility, and yet, if I may have a brief show of hands, how many of you have ever seen or read a play William Shakespeare? Wow. <laughs> Millions. <laughs> Any contact with the bar whatsoever? Just keep your hands up. Okay. Dude, we're screwed. <laughs> I think they may know more than we do. You're an eminent Shakespeare scholar. No, sweetie. I'm a freedom. Then go be preeminent. <laughs> you're right, you're, you're right. <clears throat> Let's see. How many of you have ever seen or read a play called All's Well That Ends Well? Okay. <coughs> um, let's see if we have any preeminent Shakespearean scholars here tonight. Um, how many of you have ever seen or read King John? King John, anyone? Okay. Not very many. <laughs> you, seen it? Read it? I read it. Okay, how about you? Seen it? Oh, such a sad. Oh, how about you? Seen it? Read it? Um, well, I downloaded it. Would you mind telling us what it's about? Um, it's about a hunchback. What? Um, no. King John is not about a hunchback. Yes, thank you. Someone knows this Shakespeare. As any preeminent Shakespearean scholar can tell you, King John is about a king named John. Now, could you say that, please? Ladies and gentlemen, look at this man, abandoned by our educational system. <laughs> now, <laughs> yeah, I do. Now, look at the person sitting next to you. Go ahead, look at them. Don't you recognize that same vapid expression? The same pores clogged with intellectual immaturity? Or do you perhaps see, keep looking, I tell you to stop, keep looking. Don't you see there a longing plea for literary salvation? Can I sit down now? No, you stand there before us as a living symbol of today's society whose capacity to comprehend, no, 
much less attain the genius of William Shakespeare, systematically sodomized by the Real Housewives of New Jersey. <laughs> Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, abandon the cheap thrill of the car chase for the splendor of the sonnet. Exchange the isolation of your iPhones for the gentle ideals of the I am. Imagine a world where manly men were picked up with pride. Hallelujah! Woo! Thank you. <laughs> a world where this book we found in every hotel room in the world. Can I get another amen? Amen, Olivia. Thank you. Now, join us on this quest, our Shakespeare and Jihad. Thank you, Jesus. You go ahead. I'm a bit more. I'm doing a pretty good job. Woo! Go to the yes. <laughs> Now, on with the show, and may the bar be ever in your favor. Do a job. William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare was born in 1564 in Stratford-upon-Avon, Warwickshire. The third of eight children, he was the eldest son of John Shakespeare, a locally prominent merchant, and Mary Arden, the daughter of a Roman. A Catholic member of the landed gentry, in 1582 he married a farmer's daughter, Anne Hathaway. Oh. Different Anne Hathaway. <laughs> Shakespeare arrived in London in 1588. There he dictated to his secretary, Rudolf Hess, the work Mein Kampf, in which he set forth the restoration of Germany to a dominant position in Europe. <laughs> after the rest, after reoccupying the Rhineland zone between France and Germany and annexing Austria, the Sudetenland, and the remainder of Czechoslovakia, Shakespeare invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939, thus precipitating World War II. I never knew that before. <laughs> Shakespeare remained in Berlin when the Russians entered the city. There he committed suicide with his mistress, Ava Perot. His body is buried in the church at Stratford, but his head is frozen in a holding tank in Glendale, California. Thank you! Well, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we are proud to present the complete works of William Shakespeare. Elbridge. <laughs> All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man, in his time, plays many parts. How many parts exactly must one man play? Well, according to my computations, there are 1,122 roles in all of William Shakespeare's work. When, to my take, for example, his most popular play, Romeo and Juliet. Two star-crossed lovers, a meddling nurse, a sympathetic priest, but to the story. But Mercutio, Lady Capulet, unsightly fat on Shakespeare's otherwise muscular body of work. Let us, therefore, begin our shrinkage of Shakespeare's canon by rendering the gristle and blubber of one of his greatest romantic tragedies down to the tender, moist, underaged flesh of Romeo and Juliet. Prologue. <coughs> Two households, both alike in dignity and fair of what we lay our seats. From ancient grudge, brick new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. A pair of star crossed lovers who take their life, who misadventures hideous, all with those who do with their death bury their fair strength. Act one, scene one. Behold, two men in search of a broker. For the Capulets, Samson. For the Montagues, Bimbolio. For in this front piece shall be undone. And tragedy begin with the bite of a thumb. Oh, oh my life! Oh, 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 no, sir, but I do bite my thumb. Do you bite your thumb at me, sir? No, sir. I do not bite my thumb at you, sir. Do you quarrel, sir? Quarrel, sir? No, sir. Well, if you do, sir, I am for you. I know it's gonna manage you. No better. Yes, better. You lie. Down with the mouth, you. Of yours, Capulet. Repose your subject. Oh, come. Thanks, <laughs> the Prince. Enemies to the feet. On pain of torture, throw your mistippered weapons to the ground and hear the sentence of your movement, Prince. Buzz kill you. Captain, shall come along with me. Buzz 
Lilio, come you this afternoon to know your father the pleasure in this case. Brown nose. Shark! <laughs> oh, where's Romeo? Saw you him today? Right glad I am he's not this red. But see, he comes. Good morrow, cuz. The day's so young. But new struck nothing. I mean, sad hours seem long. What sadness lengthens Romeo's hours? Not having, but which having makes them short. In love? Out. Out of love? Out of her favor where I am. Alas, that view, alas, that love satirist and proof should be so rough and tears and proof. Yes. Yes. <laughs> alas, that love, whose view is muffled still, stood without eyes, save half rays to his moon. Oh. 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 Go use the feast of Capulets. There sucks the fair Rosaline of whom thou lovest. Go thither, compare the face with some that I shall show, and I shall make thee think thy swan a crow. None fairer than my love. There's free beer. Uh oh, let's go. <laughs> now, hie we to the piece of Capulets where Romeo shall meet his Juliet. Yes. <laughs> oh, she doth teach the torches to burn bright. Did my heart live till now? Forswear it, sight. For I never saw the true beauty. If I profane with my unworthy stand, this gentle shrine, the gentle mind is this, my lips, two blushing pilgrims ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. Oh, good pilgrim, you <laughs> belong to the touch, which mannerly devotion shows the lips, for they have hands that pilgrim hands do touch, <laughs> and palm to palm, the holy palmer's kiss. <laughs> have not saints lips, and holy palmer's too? I pilgrim. But that they must use <laughs> Oh, then, dear saint, let them do what hands do. Oh, lips do not move, though cramps for prayer's sake. <laughs> then move not, of all my prayers effect I take. Then from my lips, the, then they have to talk. Sin from my lips. Oh, trespass, sweetly urged, give me my sin again. I don't want to kiss you, man. <laughs> In script, so. You kicked by the book. Oh, coming, mother. <laughs> oh, is she a Capulet? Aye, so I fear the more is my Um, Ryan? What are you doing? The not you see. Ah, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks. Oh, Romeo, oh, Romeo. Wherefore art thou, Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Or if thou wilt not, but be thwarted, my love, and I will no longer be a Capulet. For what is the name anyway? That which we call a nose by any other name would still smell. <laughs> Romeo, doff thy name, and of thy name, which is no part of me, take all myself. I take thee at thy word. Call me but love, and I shall be baptized. What did you just say? <laughs> Call me but love. And I shall be my baptist. But love? <laughs> baptist? The line is, Call me but love. Oh, so you're but love. <laughs> you control three things tonight. Really, my feels right. Now. What man art thou? Art thou not Romeo? And a Montague? Neither fair me, if either be this like. Doth thou love me then? I know thou twill say I am. I will take thy word, but if thou swearest, thou mayest prove false. Oh, Romeo, if thou dost love me, pronounce it faithfully. <laughs> Lady, by yonder blessed moon, I swear. Oh, swear not by the moon. <laughs> well, what shall I swear by? <sighs> Lady, by yonder blessed hottie in the first row, I swear. <laughs> Do not swear at all. Although I joy in thee, I have no joy in this contract tonight. It is too sudden, too rash, too unadvised, too like lightning which doth lead to be ere one you say to my dear. Sweet good night. Sweet good night. Sweet good night. Sweet good night. Over here! <laughs> or wilt thou leave me yet so? What satisfaction canst thou have tonight? 
We spent way too long on Romeo and Juliet, guys. So? Okay, it is a classic, unlike our next play. When Shakespeare wrote as a 24-year-old starving artist desperate in need for a hit but too poor to know where his next meal was coming from, no surprise that obsession with food dominates our next tragedy, the primitive revenge drama Titus Andronicus, which we now present to you as a cooking show. <laughs> Hi, y'all. <laughs> I'm Titus Andronicus. Welcome to the Gory Gourmet. Now, when you've had a lousy day, your left hand chopped off, both your sons killed, your daughter raped, her tongue cut out, and both her hands chopped off, well, the last thing you want to do is cook. <laughs> Unless, of course, you cook the rapist and serve it to his mother at a dinner party. <laughs> My daughter Lavinia and I will show you how. Good evening, Lavinia. Good evening, Lavinia. <laughs> How are we feeling today? I'm so good, Lavinia. I got my hands chopped off, my tongue chopped off. Who made me? How do you think I feel? Well, it's a Debbie Downer, ain't it? I don't know how they're holding that bowl in our hands. It's the Tyler. <laughs> we'll get our revenge, won't we? Now, Hawk Villain, I will grind your bones to dust, and of your blood and of it I'll make a paste, and of that paste a coffin I will rear, and make a pasty of your shameful head. Come, Lavinia, receive thy blood. Now, what we want to do is make a nice clean incision from carotid artery to jugular vein, like so. Bye bye now. <laughs> Be sure to use a big bowl for this because the human body has about four quarts of blood in it. And when that is dead, which should be right about now, let me go grind his bones to powder small and with this hateful liquor temper and let his vile head be baked about 350 degrees, depending on your oven. And 40 minutes later, you have this lovely human head pie, which I have prepared earlier. Don't look nice. <laughs> Who will be the first to try this delicious, high-protein treat? Welcome, gracious Lord. Welcome, drag queen. We'll please you eat. We'll please you feed. It's finger looking good. <laughs> finger Yeah, <laughs> Be sure to tune in tomorrow when Simona Vazquez has a medium new take on that great salad. Until then, say goodnight, Lydia. Good night, Olivia. Good night, Olivia. <laughs> First time to hear. Not y'all. We cooked it, now let's book it. <laughs> But inexplicably, it was the biggest hit of Shakespeare's lifetime, which allowed Shakespeare to broaden his artistic horizons. For example, compare the immaturities of Titus Andronicus to the complex subtleties of the human condition revealed in his dark and brooding tragedy, Othello, the Moor of Venice. Speak of me as I am. But nothing extenuates of one who looked wisely, but not too well. For there was never story more well than of this, of Odello and his Desdemona. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so he's African-Italian. Sure. 
Okay, guys, I got this idea. It's sort of old school and it's totally bogus, I promise. We just gotta get a beat though. So, here's the story of a brother by the name of Old Fellow. He liked white women and he liked women color. Olivia. It is I, Dimitri Shrew by Olivia. Come hither. 
Whither? Hither. From thither. If you come in, I'll show you my thither. <laughs> Act 4. On the twelfth night of a midsummer, a puckish sprite leads all the lovers deep into a forest and squeezes the aphrodite juice of a hermaphroditic flower into their eyes, while the queen of the fairies seduces a rude mechanical who has the head of an ass. Hee-haw! How? <laughs> Act 5. In the ensuing barnyard beach bash, the princess's true identity is revealed, and the merchant recognizes his sister. My nearly identical twin! My long lost and strangely attractive brother. The shrew realizes she's actually by curious. Oh, great world! The dashing young soldier takes the donkey to be his noble steed. The Jew exits, pursued by a bear. I and they all go out to dinner and get married in the state of Massachusetts. Now, give us your hands if we be friends. Because yes. all is well that finally ends. Thank you! Okay, so 16 plays in five minutes, not bad, but if you want to let them out by midnight, we have to head back to tragedies. Tragedies! <laughs> Interestingly, we've discovered Shakespeare's comedies aren't nearly as funny as his tragedies. That's so true! You know what's funny? This guy's play. Oh yeah, my best! Don't say it. Why not? Because it's cursed! It's bad luck to see the name of a show in the theater unless you're performing. That's why we refer to it as the Scottish play. Sarah, we are performing it. And there is nothing remotely Scottish about it. It's all in the performance, Shania. It has to be done so you can see the heather rippling on the highlands, feel the summer breeze wafting up your kilt, and smell the vomit steaming in the alley outside the pub. Good idea. Whisk it, kilt, spoon it! Ladies and gentlemen, we are now proud to present our authentically Scottish production of Mock Beth. Double, double, quite a land travel. Perfect mock speaker, tell me more! Macbeth, Macbeth, beware Macduff, for no man of woman born shall harm Macbeth. Till Burnham would come to Dunsany, don't you know? Oh, that's dead great! Then Macwat, Macneed, Macall, Macfear, Macduff! See me! No, that Macduff was from his mother's womb and time near it. What do you think about that? Oh, I do nay like it. But I support women's right to choose. Now, lay on, Highness Breath. You killed me, wife. You murdered me, wee bairn. And you did a poop in the third. Right, you okay. Oh. I you did. I did throw half of it away. Here lies the Usuber cursed head. My bed, your arse is at the window. <laughs> and no, that never was there a story of more blood and death than this old shirt. And this is my bed. Thank you. <laughs> Meanwhile, in ancient Rome, Julius Caesar was a much beloved tyrant. All hail Julius Caesar! Hail. Who was born by a soothsayer? We were in the Ides of March. The great Caesar, however, chose to ignore his warning. What the hell are the Ides of March? The of March. Oh, why, that's today! Hey, you friends! <laughs> friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I've come to bear with Caesar. So bear with and let's get on to my play. Anthony. And Cleopatra. Check. Oh, behold, is this an ass by single forty? Come in this French. Take heed. Oh, yes, no. Oh, my God. Whoa, 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 Olivia, stop. What? You have this bizarre notion that all of Shakespeare's tragic heroines barf on people before they die. <laughs> mm, it's an interpretation. Barfing is not interpretation. Well, they were into it, right guys? Delaney? Yeah, she was into it. <laughs> Olivia, Antony and Cleopatra have nothing to do with gastrointestinal distress. 
It's a trans-global thriller about political maneuvering across the ancient Mediterranean. Oh, I love Shakespeare's trans-global plays. Like, the one that totally predicted 21st century wireless communications. What? Yeah, it's called Two Noble Kinsmen. Ryan, Shakespeare wrote a play called Two Noble Kinsmen. Not Two Mobile Kinsmen? Two, two Noble Kinsmen. Um, pretty sure it's Mobile, and the two kinsmen are Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. No. <laughs> the two kinsmen are cousins who fall in love with the same woman. Oh, and they're like texting her. OMG, Elba, you're my BFF. No. no. Yes. Oh, whatever. I've never heard of that play. <laughs> well, that's because two noble kinsmen falls into the category of Shakespeare's plays, which are neither comedy, tragedy, or history, but what scholars refer to as the problem plays, or in some circles, the obscure plays, or the lesser plays, or just simply the bad plays. However, not all of Shakespeare's bad plays are completely without merit. In fact, one of them, Troilus and Cressida, is hardly poop at all. I actually discuss it in my unpublished monograph entitled I Love My Willy. Oh, you guys would love it. In fact, I'm gonna take it after you right now. <laughs> monograph. Oh, actually, funny you ask. Um, somewhere. Oh, an uncrustable. Yeah. Well, when... Do not take that. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh. Okay, why don't we do a performance art interpretive dance version of whatever that is? Oh, I love interpretive performance arts. It's so. Ryan, what's that word? Um, pretentious. No, it's pretentious. Yeah, she's right, right. Pretentious. I'll give her up. Actually, um, I was thinking of a more straightforward, scholarly approach. Oh. Nah, screw that. Don't worry. <laughs> Why don't you just read and we'll interpret? Well, okay. <clears throat> Troilus and Cressida, written in 1603, published in Porto in 1604, although this version is some 166 lines longer than the second Porto edition published in 1645, which is some 166 lines shorter. Is there anything in there about the plot? The plot? Of course I cover the plot. Right here on footnote 29. Troilus, the youngest son of Priam, king of Troy. Okay, you be the king and you be Troilus. Okay. Loves Cressida, and I'll just get the wings, and plans a meeting with her uncle Pandarus. Though she feigns indifference, she's attracted to him. I have to feign indifference? Yeah. And Agamemnon, the Greek commander, has surrounded the Trojans. Agamemnon! Yeah? Boring! This is the type of stuff that kids hate to study in school because it's so boring. Yeah, as soon as you said Agamemnon, I was asleep. Oh. No, I'm sorry guys, but I promised them I would not do dry, boring, vomitless Shakespeare. Look, you don't even know these people. That's not true. We bonded while I was sitting out there. There's Lillian. She came all the way across town on a bus to be here tonight. And there's Jennifer, who has a test on Monday, and she hasn't even studied for it. Dumb. And uh, little Timmy, who <laughs> thought he was coming to see Wicked and totally feels ripped off. <laughs> What's your point, Ryan? My point is, I love these people, and I don't want to see them get turned off to Shakespeare. That's what happened to me. When I was in school, and we were supposed to be studying Shakespeare, I'd be looking out the window, watching the kids playing ball, thinking, why can't this Shakespeare stuff be more like sports? Sports? How do you mean? Well, sports are engaging, <laughs> exciting. I mean, take the histories, for example. All those kings running up and down the court, throne passing from one guy to the next. It's exactly like football. Hey guys, I'm just finding you ways, but... Um, no, we're not you lonely. But you <laughs> But you do it with a crown. Hey! They are kind of similar, aren't they? Great! I got a whistle in here. <whistles> Alright, let's dig it your squad now. Yeah. <laughs> 25, 22, 23, 23, the fourth. Part one, part two. Oh. Century monarch. He's fading back to past, looking for an air down field, but there's a heavy rush by King John. My gross flesh sinks downward. The crowd is in the air, and Henry the Sixth comes up with it. Oh, victory is mine! But he's immediately hit by King John. <laughs> oh no, he's cutting Henry the Sixth into three parts. That's gotta hurt. King John is in the clear. <laughs> 
My soul hath elbow room. He's at the 40, the 30, the 20. Ooh, but he's poisoned on the 10 yard line. Replacing him now is number 72, King Lear. To Regan and Donald, I hand off my kingdom. Cordelia, go home. Penalty marker, fictional character on the field. Lear is disqualified and he's not happy about it. Bastards! Lined up now is that father son duo of Henry V and Prince Hal. Sam snaps to the quarterback. Quarterback gives to the hunchback. Looks like Richard III's limp is giving him trouble. A horse, a horse, the king needs my horse! Fumble! And Henry VIII comes up with it. He's at the 15, the 10. He snaps to the five yard line, chop off his wife's head. Who's for dead? Olivia, 
Morgan. Okay. So a uh, polar bear walks into a bar. <laughs> the bartender says, why the big paws? Polar bear says, don't know. I've always had them. <laughs> All right, so um, last night I was having this weird dream. You know, typical actor's anxiety dream. We were doing this show, and it's going great. We're making amazing time, but we kind of realize we don't know anything about Shakespeare, and we're kind of just making up stuff as we go along. And then Sarah, Jamie, and Shania just disappear, and I'm left on stage with a whole hour to fill. And then it's time for intermission, and the lights go out, and I'm naked. <laughs> hey guys, hey. did you have a nice intermission? Yeah. 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 What'd you do? Sorry, I did. Oh, nice. Uh, was there a long line at the ladies' room? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I hate that. <laughs> hey, who forgot to turn off their cell phone? Oh. Oh, it's Sarah! Hey Sarah, where are you? Oh, which airport? <laughs> oh, do you have Jamie? Call her on the phone. What the hell do you think you're doing? What? Oh, I'm sorry. Hi Jamie, how are you? <laughs> oh, I'm fine. Wait. No, I'm not fine. I'm standing on stage with a bunch of people just staring at me. Hi. Well, you may not speak with Lillian. Because she's very upset with you, and she wants nothing to do with you until you're back on stage performing Shakespeare like a little trooper. Yes, that does sound like something she would say. Okay. All right, I'll see you soon. Put Sarah back on. Yes, I love you too. Okay. Hey, Sarah, how far away are you? Okay. All right, good. No, I'm not naked. All right, I'll see you soon. Oh, and make sure you don't give Jamie any candy. You know her blood sugar. Sarah? Okay, well, um, they're on their way back. But in the meantime, that reminded me that we should cover Shakespeare's sonnets. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, Shakespeare wrote 154 Shakespearean sonnets, which we've condensed into these three by five cards. And what I was thinking is we could just pass them along the row. You take it, read it, enjoy it, pass it to the person next to you, and so on down the row. Pass it to the person behind you, forth and back, forth and back, back and forth, back and forth. And by the time it gets to you, all the way in the back, Sarah, Jamie, and Shania should be back. So, ready? Ladies and gentlemen, Shakespeare's Sonnets. Denmark. 
Oh! <laughs> that this two, two sons of flesh should melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dirt. <laughs> that it should come to this, but two months dead, still loving my mother. Frailty! That name is Molly. Yeah, not you. You. <laughs> Married with my uncle, my father's brother, the funeral make me sit coldly furnished forth the marriage tables. Lord. Horatio, methinks I see, methinks I see my father. My lord, I think I saw him yesternight. Saw him? Yes. But where was this? Upon the platform, where we watched. It is strange. I will watch tonight, perchance to walk again. All is not well, but the night will come. The yeah, but truly, it is very cold. Look, my lord, it comes. Hey, angels and ministers of grace, defend us! Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Mark me! Speak! I am bound to hear! What not revenge when thou shalt hear? If ever this thy dear father love, revenge his foul, most unnatural murder. Murder? Murder. The serpent that these things thy father's life now wears. My uncle! Your uncle? Let not the royal bed of Denmark be a couch for incest. Incest! A couch! I do have it. <laughs> Spouting 
killing our televisions and embracing the bar, that was all just a lie? No. And you stole my trademark screen? Oh, I don't even know you anymore. <laughs> I thought the world of Shakespeare and Scott's real fast cars and hot bees, but it's not. It's with quartos and quartrains and ibbits and folios and big sleeves and it's so cold. But when I'm in Seattle and everyone's all steamy and dreamy and saving lives, oh, it's for the job. Well, I hope you're really proud of yourself, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> Looks like we're going to have to skip the to be or not to speech. What? We cannot skip the to be or not to be speech. Well, it's one of those famous speeches in all Shakespeare. Olivia, it's overrated. What? <laughs> overrated? Yeah, I mean, think about it. Hamlet talks about killing his uncle, and suddenly he talks about killing himself. Where did that come from? It completely weakens his character. No, it makes it more complex. The layers give it meaning. Exactly. The layers just make it a lot more difficult. All those long speeches with big words nobody understands. Like, what's that one that goes, I have a plate, but wherefore, I know not. Lost all my mirth, forgone all customs of exercise. And yet, indeed, it goes so heavenly with my disposition that this goodly frame seems to me a stale promontory. This most excellent canopy. The air, look you. This brave overhanging firmament. This majestic roof fretted with golden fire. What a piece of work is man. How noble in reason. How infinite in faculty, in form, in moving. How express and admirable. In action, how like an angel. In apprehension. How like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. And yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights me not. I expect it itself. <laughs> Do you see, you guys? That speech was both emotional and intellectual. The two can clearly live side by side. Like Mary with Derek! Uh, have you not seen season 12? No? Oh. <laughs> so, when I see Ophelia, I could add some layers? That would be appreciated. She's not all vomit and screams, you know. There's something going on inside her pretty little wig. Oh, I get it. And I bet in the get me to another scene, she's like feeling stuff and thinking stuff. Like, at the same time. <laughs> in fact, let's do that scene first. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. You cannot watch all those layers. If Ophelia is that complex, you must still open her brain like an onion. No, that's gross. It's too gross. No, no, no. Should I? That's great. You're actually having a real moment of lucidity. We could explicate Ophelia's id, ego, and superego to a kind of Freudian analysis. Yeah, a Floridian analysis. <laughs> we could split Ophelia's brain into three parts. I'm already Ophelia, so one of you needs to play the id. Whoa, 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 whoa! I cannot play Ophelia's id. I'm already playing with Claudius. And the play within a play scene's coming up. I'm just overbooked. <laughs> Hello? Hamlet. <laughs> Fine. I'll get one of my new friends to do it. Um, um Jamie. <laughs> Jamie. This you, you can't just bring some rando up on stage to play Ophelia's brain. This is not a rando. This is one of my very best friends. Really? Okay. What's your name again? Oh, okay. Uh, do you mind if we call you Bob? It's a little easier to remember. Okay, Bob. What's happening in this scene is very important. What's happening is... Ryan, would you like to tell Bob all about the letters? Sure, Bob. It's very simple. Hamlet is playing out sublimated childhood neurosis, displacing Oedipal de desires into sexualized anger towards Ophelia. Um, Hamlet's being a prick. Yeah. And exactly. Now, the id represents the raw animal power of the individual, which Jamie has effectively encapsulated in Ophelia's trademark screen. Thank you, Ryan. You're welcome, Jamie. Okay. This is clearly over her head. <laughs> hey! Give Bob a chance. So, Hamlet gets all worked up and tells Ophelia to get out of his life. He says, 
Maybe she wants to be a corporate executive, but she also wants to raise a family. <laughs> Maybe she's tired of being pushed around and she just feels like saying, Look, cut the crap can when my biological clock is ticking and I want babies now! Okay, so... Why have them say that then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, see, we'll have you say... Cut the crap can when my biological clock is ticking and I want babies now! Okay, now, so actually, see, let's hear it one more time. Unconscious, maybe, maybe not. My biological clock is ticking. And your job as an actress is to take all these voices and blend them deep within your soul. We're going to whip everyone into a mighty frenzy and then stop everything. All attention goes to you, and at that moment of truth, you let out with that scream that epitomizes Ophelia's in. She cannot wait. <laughs> okay, everyone, let's just all take a deep breath. And remember, no matter what happens, act natural. Okay, Bob. On your mark, get set, go. Ophelia and a snacky dresser. 
Why, thanks. O oh, thou vile king, give me my father. I'll be revenged for Polonius' murder. How now, what is this? Kind maid, sweet sister, sweet Ophelia. They bore him barefaced on the beard. Hey, naughty, naughty, hey, naughty. And in his grave rained many a tear with a hey, naughty, naughty, ha, cha, cha. Fairly well, my dove. I'm mad. I'm out of my tiny little mind. See, this is acting. <laughs> Here's room for you and Rosemary for remembrance. I would have given you violets, but they withered all when my father died, you bastards! <laughs> I begin to feel a little nauseous. <laughs> Hamlet comes back. Right. What's the next scene with Ophelia? What? What's the next scene with Ophelia? There are no more scenes with Ophelia. Hamlet comes back. But I've got layers now. I'm up for it. That's all Shakespeare wrote. <laughs> Hamlet comes back. Well, what happens to her? She drowns. Oh. How can I show myself my father's son? Indeed, more than in words, too. Here I go! Oh, off stage! Forgive me. 
I justly killed by my own treachery. Heaven make thee free of it. Follow thee. You who look pale and trouble up this tent that are but youths or audiences act. Absent thee from felicity a while. And if thou ever didst hold me in thy heart, draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. The rest. I'm Ryan. I'm Sarah. I'm Shania. I'm Morgan. I'm Jamie. And I'm Matt. And, and we're 